It's Thursday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Hello, I'm Alex Forsyth. With me today, Conservative MP Anthony Brown, columnist Matthew Paris, Scottish Labour's Deputy Leader Jackie Bailey and non-affiliated peer Kate Hoey. Today, higher energy bills could be heading our way, so what, if anything, can the government do about it? Customer, uh, especially the most vulnerable, must be protected, must continue to be protected from uh, exorbitant uh, price spikes. Why are we in this position? It's because we haven't built a resilient energy system. Also on today's programme. Towards a high wage, high skill, high productivity, and yes, thereby a low tax economy. That that is what the people of this country need and deserve. The Prime Minister hails a new economy, but when will we see the benefits? And the EU will put forward its ideas next week to solve trade problems in Northern Ireland. But will it be enough for the UK? Hello. Well, let's start by looking at a couple of contrasting headlines today. The Mail Online is reporting that the end of furlough did not lead to wave of job cuts, despite fears removing COVID support scheme would spark surge in redundancies, new data suggests, which is obviously a pretty positive take. But have a look at this in The Sun, which says gas rise will add £400 to our bills. Huge blow for households. That is, of course, in relation to the recent spike again in gas prices. So, with those two different takes, I'd like to start by asking my panel, are you feeling pessimistic or optimistic about the state of the economy? Anthony. Uh, cautiously optimistic. Uh, I sit on the Treasury Select Committee and we study the economy very, very closely. And I and all mainstream economists thought at this stage the economy in far worse shape than it is. But we're actually growing really, really strongly. Unemployment has stayed low, remarkably. I mean, I'd like most people thought it would shoot right up. It's great news at the end of furlough that actually those people haven't ended up redundant. But clearly there are problems. And the, the gas price rise you mentioned is one of them. And the role of government here is really to make sure that particularly vulnerable customers don't get hit. Things like the winter fuel allowance and the cold weather payments have to continue. We'll get on to that in a bit more detail in a moment. But, Matthew, I just want to get your headline. Are you feeling optimistic or pessimistic? No, it's, it's OK for the moment. It's looking quite good at the moment. But uh, there are things coming up, coming around the corner. Cost of living, um, I, I, th I think, is, is, could prove very worrying. Uh, return to inflation could prove very worrying. Uh, increased debt could prove worrying. And um, I, I would like to see a Conservative government doing Conservative things in those directions. Shocking. Kate, what's your take on this? Well, I'm an actual optimist, but I, I, I would share the uh, view that uh, we have to be cautiously optimistic. I mean, obviously, we've got through the furlough scheme. And that, that's brilliant news, because I, if we look back, what all the warnings were going to be about, you know, t how terrible it would be when furlough came off. And also, we've got through the pandemic on the whole. And, you know, that makes me feel life is kind of getting back to a sort of normality and therefore we're going to have ups and downs on the economy. But it is, it is something that I'm very worried about what might happen in terms of inflation. Jackie, is your glass half full? Um, I'm afraid I remain very cautious and very concerned because we know the cost of living crisis that is heading you know, round the corner at us at great speed. And I genuinely don't think we're out of the woods yet in terms of employment. Remember, a number of people lost their jobs at the start of the pandemic, despite the furlough scheme. Some people are underemployed. And I know in tourism and hospitality in my local area, people are considering whether they mothball their businesses over the winter. So we are far from out of the woods. And to be honest with you, with a chancellor about to land tax rises um, that will disproportionately affect people on low incomes, with energy prices soaring, all of that taken together. And I am desperately worried about what happens this winter. OK, well, you did mention them. So let's delve a bit more into that story about gas and energy prices. Now, there's lots of reporting today about how much bills might rise by come April, because that's when the energy price cap will be revised. And we've got different estimates ranging from 400 to 600 pounds extra on energy bills. The business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, has been addressing industry on this this morning. Let's have a listen to what he had to say. 
First, the uh, government will not bail out uh, failed companies. There cannot be a reward for um, irresponsible management of, of businesses. Second, customer, uh, especially the most vulnerable, must be protected, must continue to be protected from uh, exorbitant uh, price spikes. And third, the third principle I've always uh, maintained is that the, the, the energy market should remain competitive. Quasi crossing there. Now, Anthony, he's saying the consumer must be protected, but we are looking at pretty hefty hikes come April. So should the government be doing more about this? Well, first of all, that's a global phenomenon, and there's no way the government could pay everyone's gas bills at home, and nor should it. It's the vulnerable people, the people who might end up with a choice between heating and eating in winter, uh, that they've really got to help. And uh, as I was saying earlier, there, there are schemes, the, the cold weather payments, the winter fuel allowance. Uh, there's, there's another scheme that absolutely have to continue through the winter to make sure that people uh, on low incomes can continue to eat their home. But home given the, the scale of the potential price rises we're looking at, should some of those schemes perhaps be bumped up, given where we are now? Well, we, we, we have to see where the gas price goes. I mean, it's actually, it, it spiked yesterday and it's come down again now. So it's, uh, it's but going... But it's on a pretty place. clear trajectory, it, it, it isn't probably, it? It probably will stay high, but it's still, uh, it's, uh, you know, we're just at the beginning of October. Uh, we need to see where, where we go on that. The other, the other critical thing the government must do and has done is, is uh, if there are key critical sects of the economy that uh, grind to a halt, and we saw that with the production of seat carbon dioxide, uh, and they stepped in there to make sure that continues, but uh, absolutely in a way that doesn't bail out irresponsible companies that didn't hedge against gas price rises, which is exactly what they should do. We'll, we'll come back to that point about businesses and companies that are struggling with this in a moment. But, Jackie, I just want to get your thoughts about whether when it comes to protecting the consumer at the moment, enough is being done. No, frankly, not enough is being done. It's one thing to continue the existing schemes, but faced with price rises, you know, of 400 to 500 pounds, frankly, people will struggle. You need to take this at the same time as universal credit uplift of 20 pounds has been removed and people will really struggle this winter. What, what the government, I think, fails to recognise is that the people most badly affected are those on low and fixed incomes. Pensioners across Scotland, across the UK, will find this a struggle to find the extra money because they are on fixed incomes. In Scotland, what we've been suggesting to the SNP government here is that they should actually increase the winter fuel supplement from the 100 to 300 pounds by a minimum of 70 pounds to try and help people to cope. I would encourage the UK government to follow suit. Just come back on that point, Anthony, about universal credit, if you can, because we've heard a lot about this, haven't we? That is something that's being withdrawn from the lowest income families just at the time we're looking at these price rises. Do you think there is any scope for the government to revisit this? Uh, I mean, it was, a it was always a temporary uplift and it was always going to come to an end and it came, came to an end and we're back where we started beforehand. And the, the critical thing, I mean, the best way to help people on, on low incomes and to tackle poverty is to get people into work and to give people the skills to get higher paid jobs. And that's been the real focus of government policy. And we've got unemployment at, uh, you know, historic low levels despite the pandemic, which is extraordinary. And the government putting real focus on skills, uh, apprenticeships, the lifetime skills guarantee, T levels, etc., to help people get higher paid jobs. And indeed, that was the whole sort of focus of uh, the Prime Minister's speech. OK, Matthew, where do you sit on this? Well, well on the issue of winter fuel supplement, I, I think it's a good idea to put that up, but that people like me shouldn't be eligible for it. It really should be concentrated on, on the poorest. But the, the trouble with isolating particular sectors and giving them more money, you know, the very poorest or people on universal credit, is it begins to introduce distortions, it, it begins to introduce demotivations for, for some people, and the government hasn't got a lot of money to spare at the moment. The Chancellor's right about that. Boris Johnson keeps throwing out um, new spending ideas like, like confetti, but these things have to be paid for. The government cannot take over most people's energy bills. That, that's, that's the Soviet Union. I just want to show you this headline from Bloomberg where it says France is to give families 580 million euros to pay energy bills. Now, that is the extension of an existing voucher scheme to help families with the cost of energy. Kate, do you think something like that or an extension of the existing mitigations is the right way to go? Well, I think Anthony is right that we, we really need to see how this kind of pans out over the next month or so. There obviously may well be that the gas prices come down, but I think it it is quite likely. I was actually surprised that the Prime Minister in his speech didn't. I thought he would pull something out of the hat and actually say that perhaps the uh, 
uh, you know, the contribution would be at £10, that would continue or something like that. I think something will have to happen. And I think the idea of the winter fuel allowance going up is a good idea, but absolutely right. It shouldn't go to everybody. But I also think it's also an opportunity for us to look again at, you know, our whole way and our reliance that we've now putting in onto renewables and the fact that our energy mix is so is so narrow. Um, you know, we can't go on like this and we're going to have to accept that if, you know, the serious nature of trying to tackle climate change by, you know, decarbonizing in such a, a quick way and in a very radical way is actually going to affect poor people far, far more across the country than many of the issues that are happening at the moment. So I'm, I think we need a real, you know, root and branch look at what's happening in our, in our energy market and how we're dealing with this in the future and not just go along with the kind of glibness all the time oh it's all about climate change Anthony the business secretary Kwasi Kwarteng has been making that point that actually there does need to be a focus on shifting energy supply in a more resilient sector with a move towards renewables in the future do you think that that is realistic or is there just a bit of a disconnect between people who are facing higher bills right now uh, no, I think absolutely we really need to focus on the energy supply resilience. We've actually got uh, a lot of wind power now, which we didn't have some, year, uh, some years ago. Most electricity is actually generated from wind power, but I think this increases the uh, argument for nuclear. Definitely, I'd like to see uh, the government really sort of push forward with the nuclear agenda. I've always been uh, brought in favour of uh, nuclear power, as so long as it's cost effective. Uh, it's rather stalled the whole scheme over the last uh, recent years. So I think we, we need that for the baseload. But yeah, throughout the pandemic, one lesson we've learned on a whole range of different sectors is that resilience really matters and we shouldn't be uh, complacent and energy resilience matters more than most. Jackie is that the right but I don't think we should uh, I, I don't think we should forget that you know the wind the, the wind farms are getting huge subsidy which has actually put costs already on our electricity bills and you know that I'm I'm afraid there's sometimes I think a very sort of almost naive view about uh, the, the the crucial nature of wind power uh, and um, that's what I think we should be looking at. Jackie, your take on this? I mean, I do think we need a root and branch review of our energy supply and our energy mix. That's why in Scotland, Scottish Labour are proposing an energy commission to do exactly that. We all talk about just transition and climate change and the need to end the use of fossil fuels, but actually nobody is doing the hard work that will demonstrate how that's done in a way that protects employment, but also ensures that energy prices going forward are affordable. You know, at the end of the day, there will be people sitting at home this winter making a choice between eating and heating. And in a country as rich as the United Kingdom, that is simply unacceptable. OK, well, there is another aspect to this, and this is, of course, the firms that are particularly dependent on energy to keep going. I want to bring in this headline from The Guardian today, which says UK industry could face shutdowns as wholesale gas price hits record high. They're talking about things like steel, chemical, chemicals, fertiliser industries and the possible impact of them of these soaring gas prices. Matthew, we have seen something of an interventionist approach from government during the pandemic. Do you think that's set the bar? Is there an expectation they'll have to keep doing this now and helping out some of these Yes, firms? there is, uh, and, uh, and, it, and it worries me. You've got to be really careful starting to subsidise industries that say they're having difficulty with the, the price of gas. Who, who gets it? Who doesn't get it? And once they've got it, it's very hard to take it away again, as we've seen with the universal uh, uh, credit uh, temporary increase. Uh, I, I, th I, I wouldn't say that you must never intervene to help a, a critical industry through a critical period. But I do think you've, you've got to start with a pretty resistant attitude to doing that kind of thing. Anthony. I can completely agree with what Matthew said, actually. I think it's a really, really dangerous slope to go down where you uh, end up with broad subsidies for industry. They lose the incentive to then sort of make sure they don't get into the same situation again in future, uh, to work out other ways of doing things with less uh, you know, cost for gas, for example. Uh, trying to ease them off it is very difficult. The government ends up controlling the whole industry. I mean, it's not it's a really bad route to go down. But clearly, if there are absolutely critical things, which you saw with the carbon dioxide and the impact that had through the supply That's chain, right. as we all learned, then, you know, fair enough, step in for three weeks, make sure that sort of keeps going. But, uh, you know, broadly, you can't have the government bailing out the whole of industry. Some of the industries involved in this, though, are saying, look, this is a, this is a wholesale gas price unexpected spike which is beyond our control and we did try to hedge against it, but there's a limit to what we could have done. So if it comes to the point where there are jobs on the line in fairly big numbers in the sector, is that the point the government has to step in? 
Well, I really just repeat what I said, that actually clearly the government has to look at if there are critical things where the country is going to grind to a halt in some way and there isn't food on the shelves, or the, the, as we found with the carbon dioxide thing. But uh, generally, it's up to business to sort out its own problems rather than for the government to try and uh, run businesses. OK. Well, this turbulence, if you want to call it that, that we're seeing in parts of the economy at the moment was, according to Boris Johnson during the party conference, uh, just part of a step, a transition to a new economic model. He set out his vision for what he called a high-wage economy. Let's take a little listen to what he had to say. We are embarking now on a change of direction that has been long overdue in the UK economy. We're not going back to the same old broken model with low wages, low growth, low skills and low productivity, all of it enabled and, in, and assisted by uncontrolled immigration. Matthew, is this his Thatcher moment? Well, no, that's not an economic model. That's just a wish list. You know, we wish we had higher productivity. We, we wish we could invest more in science and technology. We'll have to see what he actually does about it. But to, I, I, I'm old enough to remember Harold Wilson, a Labour Prime Minister, talking about forging a new Britain in the white heat of the technological revolution. These phrases come very easily at leaders' speeches at party conferences. Making them a reality is another thing altogether. Anthony. Well, I mean, there's, right, there's a whole range of different things here the government need, needs to do to promote economic growth. But on the particular things that uh, the Prime Minister was talking about, I mean, there are sectors of the economy, certain industries, which have got reliant on a, a regular supply of uh, labour and, and therefore not having to train people up or improve paying conditions. The one that we've all been focused on is the lorry drivers. I mean, the more I've read about the conditions of the lorry drivers, actually, the more shocked I've been that they are so badly treated, uh, you know, expected to go to the toilet on the side of the road and sleep in their, you know, sleep in their cabins and eat food out of cardboard boxes, etc. Why? Why, why can't they go and stay in travel lodges? And I'm really not surprised that they've uh, effectively just said, well, enough's enough, we're going to go and work elsewhere where paying conditions better. And actually, th the, uh, the lorry drivers now recently have seen huge pay rises. They've had to, the employers have had to increase pay. I was reading an interview with one who's had a 50% pay increase, and he was very happy with it. Uh, and that, that's the, the, tr the danger is, I mean, I'm absolutely all in favour of immigration, and particularly skilled immigration, but if companies become dependent on cheap labour as part of their business model, then it, that's a, uh, you know, damaging for employers generally. What about this point, though, that actually the Prime Minister is trying to hail this as a huge economic reset? And Matthew's making the point it quite simply isn't. It's just a wish list. There's no policy behind this. You might want a new economy, but you have to do something about getting well, there. The, the policy that was a focus of what the Prime Minister was saying there was about, the, the, obviously, the immigration system and the, the uh, you know, we've gone from having freedom of movement to labour with roughly 500 million people able to work here without getting a visa to having a, a controlled immigration system. And that, but clearly, there is a lot more to economic policy. And I don't think the Prime Minister there was actually trying to lay out the whole of uh, economic policy. We've got the, the, the budget and the comprehensive spending review in a couple of weeks, and I'm sure there'll be a whole load of uh, other messages there about the, I mean, Matthew mentioned being a science superpower, for example, you know, investment and research and development and so on, uh, you know, all that will come. Kate, what did you make of it? Did you feel like this was a turning point for the economy or something else? Well, I thought it was a great Boris speech, uh, you know, typical of Boris and particularly for a Conservative Party conference and morale raiser and all of that. Yes, absolutely, there was no real detail, but we do have the comprehensive spending review coming and I'm sure that we'll have to have uh, a lot more to actually shows how we're going to achieve that. But what I really liked, obviously, as someone who campaigned uh, on one of the reasons I campaigned to leave the European Union was the fact that we did need to control uh, low uh, wages in terms of um, immigration. And there's no doubt about it. Uh, and people said that at the time, wages will rise. And that is going to what is going to happen. So I think for those sort of red wall seats up in the north of England and, and where, that uh, have gone over to being uh, voting Conservative, this will be something that should help that part of the levelling up agenda that we hear about. So uh, in terms of the actual economy, I think we are you know, going, as we talked about earlier, we're, we're going to face a very difficult time. And uh, I will be most interested in the detail of what happens in the comprehensive spending review. Jackie, there are some people that thought what the Prime Minister said around immigration was something of a reaction to what Sir Keir Starmer said at the Labour conference when he suggested you should just increase temporary visas to potentially quite a high degree where there are shortages. What do you think about that? To be honest, we have relied on immigration over the years, but, but we've also relied on high-skilled immigration for our economy and for our public services. You know, whether it's HEV drivers or indeed nurses for the NHS, 
immigration has served this country well, provided that it's on a planned basis and it's aimed at gaps in the labour market. But, you know, I, I listened intently to Boris Johnson's speech and, and there's no doubt he's a showman. But frankly, there was no detail. The, there is no plan or substance to what he said. And, you know, I would maybe forgive him if Boris Johnson was a stranger to government, but he's been in government for a long time. He's been prime minister for a good few years now, and he has pre presided over low wage, low skilled economy with inflation rising. You know, let's let's not pretend he is embracing a new economic model when actually you need to look at his record in government and what he actually delivers is entirely different. Well, businesses certainly don't seem to have taken too kindly to it being suggested that the owners should be on them right now. Let's just take a look at the front page of The Times, which says, PM hit by business backlash. And the subheading, which is quite small, so I'll read it to you, says, pro-Brexit bosses insist firms cannot be treated like a sponge to soak up rising costs. Anthony, the business reaction hasn't been brilliant to the Prime Minister's speech, has it? Uh, not, not, not for the ones you're just quoting, but I mean, it is a difficult time for business. There are all the things we've been talking about: increased energy prices, there's various, you know, supply chain things. We talked about the the, um, the fuel and so on. Uh, and uh, but it isn't the the government cannot fix all the problems of uh, businesses. But I think it's absolutely fair for the government to say on a particular issue of immigration that you uh, use the Boris quote about to say that actually businesses uh, they have a responsibility not to rely on cheap, uh, unskilled immigration as part of their business model. That they need to train people up. They need to give people the skills, they need to automate uh, and invest in, in that higher productivity, because otherwise the whole economy gets distorted. Matthew. I, I don't disagree, uh, but it, it's, it's not as simple as just saying, oh, well, employers must all just pay their employees a lot more. Um, if they do, they'll have to put their prices up, and we are facing yeah. incipient inflation. These are very difficult issues. Anthony? <clears throat> well, well, clearly there is an inflationary... Um, possible inflation consequences of higher wages. But actually what happens is the companies then uh, train people up to get do greater productivity. They become So an example that we all know about, there used to be a lot of garages used to have these uh, automatic washing machines for cars, very expensive machines, the only jobs created are the people maintaining it. And uh, now we have all these uh, car washes, which are actually very low-skilled labour, people earning probably often below the minimum wage, uh, you know, and actually it's got, the automation has gone backwards by 30 or 40 years. And I want to be in the economy where you've got automatic car machines, they may not be quite as good quality as, as the good. other ones <laughs> but i mean but actually where, where, where companies invest in in automation they they have train people up to maintain those machines and so on rather than relying on a lot of cheap labor doing it very very cheaply and quickly and, and a good job no doubt but it's just there's one type of economy or another and i prefer the more uh, automated high productivity economy Kate, I just want to put to you this quote from Tim Martin, who's the chairman of Weatherspoons, um, who we know, of course, was a uh, Brexit supporter. But he says in The Times, Brexit decided that immigration policy should be decided by those we've elected, not what the policy should be. The UK now needs an intelligent debate as to the details of the policy, i.e. not closed off to the idea of immigration. What do you make of that? Well, I think, I mean, he's right in the sense that none of us uh, who campaign to leave uh, campaigned for no immigration. What we wanted to see was an end to the completely uh, free movement of anyone who wanted to come. And of course, common sense tells you that if lots of people come from countries where they weren't earning very much and they'll come over and earn a little bit more, uh, companies then don't have to even think about mm. what their local community, people who might want <coughs> that job, would do it yeah. for. So I, I think I think it, it's, it's very, very sensible that and a lot of things now will be up for discussion. One of the important things about leaving the European Union is that from now on, we can't blame, we still can on one or two areas, blame the European Union, but we now as a government, as governments, have to actually take responsibility. And, and so I think a lot of areas will be up for discussion about how we, we move now in, in a different situation where we do have control of what we do, and therefore it's our responsibility. T Matthew. Tim Martin doesn't like it up him. That, that's the, that, that's the long and the short of it. He he tried to have his cake and eat it. You know, argue against uh, immigration and uh, and uh, of course uh, benefit himself from uh, cheap uh, foreign labour in in the in the catering industry. Now that cheap labour has been taken away, he sees the consequences. And to say that we were only talking about controlling it but not actually stopping it, I, I think is a bit a bit rich. Jackie, where do you sit on this? Are you open to the idea of short-term visas potentially for some of the sectors where there are real shortages? And how far should that go? To what extent could that happen? 
Yep, I, I am absolutely in favour of it. We need to listen to industry as to what the labour market is saying shortages are. So, for example, um, the HGV industry was telling the government months and months ago that they would forecast a shortage of drivers, but the government simply didn't listen. So Labour are in favour of having a task force that brings together employers and the trade unions alongside government to do that piece of analysis sector by sector so that we understand the demands of the labour market, whether they can be fulfilled um, locally in the local economy or whether we need to look further afield and to do it in a planned and managed way based on the needs of our economy. Anthony. Um, well, the, the risk with uh, short-term visas is you have to make sure that it doesn't undermine the adjustments that businesses have to make to make it sustainable. So uh, in the haulage industry, and we did it at the Treasury Select Committee, we did a hearing with the CBI and the TUC on this just a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you have to make sure that if you do that and the government is uh, introducing some short-term visas, that it doesn't mean the, lorry, the haulier company say, right, well, we don't need to increase wages then, we don't need to increase better conditions for lorry drivers, because actually it's all sorted. So you, you need to make sure, keep the pressure up a bit for the hauliers. So how do you do that then? Because surely don't you introduce so short-term visas by or not? Yeah, you, you can introduce it with certain conditions and say, well, absolutely, we're going to stop it at this time. And you can absolutely get the haulies around the table and say, look, you, you know, you have to have, you're responsible for your own recruitment and HR policies and paying conditions to sustain the industry. You can't just expect us to issue new visa, visas for Eastern European uh, uh, lorry drivers to come and fill the gap because you're not improving paying conditions. And that, but the, the government needs to keep the pressure on the industry to do that. Jackie, do you accept that approach? No, I think if you actually sat down with the industry in advance, along with the trade unions, so it's employers and trade unions together, then I think you actually both address the terms and conditions point, but you also satisfy the need for additional HDV drivers. You know, that, that's the example of the moment. Um, the government was being warned well in advance. They ignored those warnings. You know, you cannot simply walk away and just leave it to the market to decide. You need to look at what the labour market requirements are and plan accordingly. Kate, what do you think about what? this then? Would you be open at least to the principle of some sort of short-term visa scheme if it plugs gaps for perhaps a finite period? Well, I think as long as it's short-term means short-term and it's specifically to um, you know, counteract a particular problem in a particular area for a particular time. But um, you know, the, the shortage of uh, drivers is, of course, all over uh, the EU as well. And we may find, and I think they've already found that the adverts to for people to come back under this short-term one that has been announced um not many people are coming and not as many as, as because what's what's happening now is that a lot of people who have been working here and have gone back home and they've been COVID. i think we can't underestimate the the difference the COVID uh, pandemic has made to to people's attitude to life and living and work and all of that and i think we, we're not going to find necessarily that uh, people will want to come rushing across to be gb drivers here um so we really do need uh, and i have no objection to what jackie suggested about people getting round the table and, and and discussing sector by sector but it's 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 too easy if we just simply say oh well there's a shortage now let's let lots of people come in for a short term if that short term is 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 not really a short term Matthew, is there a sort of short-term, long-term point here that Boris Johnson is talking about his economic vision, but in the meantime, the reality that people are living can quite, feel quite different? Is there a question about how long it takes to get there? Yes, that is exactly the, yeah. the question, and um, I, I agree with Anthony. You can bring in uh, short-term pain-killing measures, as it were, you know, extra visas for drivers or, 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 or care workers or, or whatever, and even though you tell the industry that um, this is only short term, you've got to take advantage of this for the longer term and, um, and get your own house in order. They won't. While they've got the painkillers, they'll take the painkillers. When it comes to the end, just like with the uplift to universal credit, they'll say, hey, you know, we, we rely on this. Exactly We've come to rely on it. Uh, so uh, exactly very sceptical about it all. Anthony, you wanted to come in. Well, no, I agree. I mean, that's exactly what will happen. I mean, they, they, they get addicted to it, as it were. And you, you've got to really... So that's why the, the government has to keep up pressure on the industry to make clear that the short term does actually mean short term, but also require of industry uh, a path out of it, as it were, like an expectation in terms of the conditions of drivers, that they start having proper facilities, for example, very basic things. But I come back to this point. Is there a problem that while the government's talking about long term, there is a short term lived reality for people who are seeing the impact of some of the 
the turbulence in the economy? Well, there is there clearly is an adjustment issue as you go from one model, as it were, to another model. It's been compounded by the fact that the whole world has been coming out of uh, the COVID pandemic at the same time. So all sorts of pressures have sort of come out in slightly awkward ways. But clearly, you know, one of the roles of government is to, if there are short term issues that don't lead to where they can give a painkiller without the painkillers becoming addictive and people wanting to take them forever, uh, maybe, you know, the government would step in and do that, as you saw with the production of carbon dioxide, for example, where they stepped in, you know, critical issue, step in, do that for Three weeks. But this, yeah, this is where um, Boris Johnson is such a skilled uh, magician. He wants to take people's eyes off the short term difficulties and fix their eyes on a glorious horizon that he he described uh, that this week in uh, in Manchester this weekend in in Manchester. It's a sort of attempt but, but to that, distract people. But that is part of the role of, of uh, conference speeches by Prime Minister. I mean, it, it's been criticised <laughs> by, by not having lots of detailed policy, but actually that's not really the place for detailed policy. As government, you can do lots of detailed policy all the time, every week, and there are indeed policies coming out that you don't doubt report on a sort of weekly basis, backed up by white papers, by uh, work done by civil servants and everything else. And I know the media love to have lots of policies in a Prime Ministerial <laughs> speech, but he's, he's painting a sense of direction and a vision of, right, this is where we're, mm. where we're going and actually if you put lots of granular detail in there that would distract from actually <laughs> we the weren't vision. asking for lots of it just just a little <laughs> bit a sprinkling of granular yes. detail perhaps yeah. <laughs> well talking of conferences of course we have heard from the two main conference party leaders now with their set piece speeches so i just want to pull back and take a look perhaps at the slightly longer term of the party conferences and how the parties themselves have evolved over time you may have been watching we have referenced it before on politics live that blair and brown documentary that's been going out on bbc2 the new labor revolution all episodes of course available on bbc iplayer i just want to show you a little clip from one of tony blair's early conference speeches when i looked at the labor party i thought it's not just a question of winning. It's a question of winning sustainably, where you own an agenda strong enough, rooted enough in people's actual lives, that you would win not one election, but two elections and three elections. The next election will offer us the chance to change our country, not just to promise change, but to achieve it. The historic goal of another Labour government, our party, New Labour, our mission, New Britain, New Labour, New Britain. Kate, you wouldn't have been able to see that, but our audience at home would have seen you applauding enthusiastically in the front row there in a, in a yellow jacket. What are your reflections on how things have moved, I suppose? Well, um, it, it's, it was a great speech. And of course, it was again exactly as I said, you know, Boris was trying to do. It, was, it made us all go away feeling so enthused and excited and, and hoping that this was the real change. Um, a little bit different from the... Uh, slightly longer Keir Starmer speech, which I have to say I, I, I didn't watch right through. Um, but, you know, that, that's what conferences are about and, and leaders have to show some kind of charisma to make, make the country and make their, their activists particularly feel that they're being led by someone who kind of knows what they're doing uh, or at least gives the impression that they know what they're doing. And, and I think, I mean, Tony Blair was very, very good at that and this without a doubt without him, Labour would not have been in power, um, you know, win three elections. And what about Keir Starmer then? Well, I, I mean, Keir just does not have the charisma and the um, ability. Um, I, I, I reviewed a couple of books that had been written about him recently and I said that at the end of it that I really hadn't found out anything more about him than anybody else knew or anybody knew about him. And uh, I didn't... I, I mean, I'm being quite honest, I don't see him as being... Um, uh, a prime minister. Uh, it's not, I'm not saying Labour won't ever win again or anything like that, but they won't. I don't think there'll be a, a Keir Starmer prime minister. Jackie, will there be a Keir Starmer prime minister? I think there most definitely will, and I would invite Kate to actually watch his speech because I think he set out very clearly who he is, what he's about, um, and that he is a serious politician with a plan for the country. What I heard from Boris Johnson was, to be frank, more about beavers than there was about the cost of living. You know, coming out of a pandemic, when the country is still struggling, when we have a lot of work still to do, I want a serious politician that will guide the country forward. I don't want a showman. Do you think the public got that from Keir Starmer? Because there is a danger, of course, with party conferences that you're talking to the party. 
Well, you're not just talking to the party. You are. You have an opportunity of media attention, which is maybe not as great in ordinary times. Um, so people were able to hear from him. And actually, there's a piece of research done by, I think it's Opinion, that assesses the public's reaction to leaders' speeches. And on virtually every measure, um, it, Keir Starmer outstripped Boris Johnson. Kate? Well, I, I mean, let's let's see. We'll see how the uh, how the polls show. The polls haven't shown a, a huge rise uh, in Labour support since uh, since the Labour conference. But these are early days. Um, you know, I I wish him well, um, but I do think this, it, it's a lot more in the Labour Party, and we need to go into this now. Than what's wrong with it than just uh, the leader at the moment. And um, I think the the over the next few months. I think Labour, just like the Conservatives, Labour is really going to have to show that it has changed and that it has actually realised why, why they lost so badly. OK, Kate, I think you might be right. That may be one for another day because we are going to move on now <laughs> and talk about something which did come up at the Conservative Party conference, and that is the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, the European Commission Vice President, Maros Sekseshkovic, which I have promised myself I wouldn't mispronounce his name, has announced this morning that the EU will bring forward new proposals uh, for the Northern Ireland Protocol next week. This is, of course, in response to David Frost. He's been speaking this morning in Dublin, so let's have a listen to what he had to say. And I think... Uh that uh, what we uh, are uh, discussing right now and uh, uh, where we would like to put the final touches uh, hopefully by the by the uh, mid of uh, next week that it's very sincere proposal but uh, from from uh, our our perspective uh, this would be really uh, i would say very far uh, reaching uh, proposal so, Kate, we know that the EU is going to enter in some sort of discussions with the UK about the problems with the Northern Ireland Protocol. So what you're hearing from the EU at the moment, is that enough for you? My bottom line is very clear. I want to see Northern Ireland back into being an integral part of the United Kingdom, which means that we shouldn't have uh, trade uh, rules. We shouldn't be left under uh, a foreign jurisdiction, the European Union, and under their court. Uh, and so all the kind of suggestions um, that the government put forward in the command paper, I very much support. But ultimately, uh, even if the EU were to accept a lot of those and we stop some of the nonsense about not letting medicines come in and having to have rabies jabs to bring your dog over from uh, mainland Britain uh, wouldn't change for me the fundamental constitutional issue that Northern Ireland uh, cannot be left out. We all had the same ballot paper saying, do you want to leave the United Kingdom, leave the European Union? It didn't say, can we leave a bit of Northern Ireland in? So I'm very clear that that, and I think that's what unionism and pro-union people in Northern Ireland want to see the constitutional issue changed. And that is quite easily changed with okay. goodwill on the side of the European Union and the Irish government. OK, a Anthony, your take on that? Well, I, I agree with K uh, Kate. You know, Northern Ireland is, is an integral part of the United Kingdom and should re remain as such. And I certainly understand the frustration of those who see these new barriers across the uh, the Irish Sea. And I, I suspect I know what Ma Matthew's going to say about all that, really, <laughs> being a regular reader of your columns. Um, but the, uh, if there's goodwill on both sides, I'm sure this is sortable. I don't think there are insurmountable problems here. I think that the negotiations haven't been good faith negotiations on both sides, I think, so far. And But actually, what you do have now is we've made proposals, the Commissioner made proposals, Presumably, they'll get somewhere in between. If well, both sides want to, they'll do it. Oddly enough, I, I completely agree with you. If there is goodwill on both sides, this is entirely soluble. But it won't please Kate. And Kate is, is, is being honest. She wants to junk the protocol. Well, I'm afraid we signed the protocol. It, it was part of our withdrawal agreement. And the European Union are going to hold us to that. And I, I can very well understand why. And actually, a majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain in the European Union, just as a footnote. Yes, but the United Kingdom voted to leave. And why should Northern Ireland people, what they're saying, they're asking themselves, why? Why are we being treated so differently? And the idea that somehow the protocol has to stay. We've got, we've, we've negotiated out of other, other tr international treaties. And of course, Article 16 is very clear that if Northern Ireland is being damaged societally or environmentally or economically, that, that it can be invoked. And David Frost but has actually, Lord Frost has suggested that it, said that it is, so it's going to have to be invoked if the EU don't accept no, that the uh, changes are happening. Art Article 16 is, is for really serious crises, for emergencies. 
Northern Ireland is not being seriously damaged at the moment, and and this is a it's an ideological. It's to some Master, degree, it's a sectarian, it's a sectarian it. issue rather than a question it. of economic no, no, no. damage. The people, the people who I live here, and I see the difference, and I see the problems that I've got. Even when I want to order something from England, being told we can't no longer because of these all these extra issues, and also the the people who say it's sectarian are people who have a an ultimately desire to see a united Ireland and are using this very, very cleverly with the Irish government to push that agenda, get an economic united Ireland, and then you lead to a political one, just like the European Union started as an economic issue and then has become more and more political. So I, I'm sorry, but David Frost recognises I have a lot of time for Lord Frost. He genuinely understands the situation. I think the Prime Minister knows that the protocol should never have been signed up to. He also knows that the EU have not uh, carried it through in the way that they thought they would carry it through, and therefore it has to go. Matthew? Well, that, that, that is, is Kate's view, that the protocol should never have been signed up to. Unfortunately for, for Kate, it was signed up to. Um, we are bound by the protocol. And with goodwill on both sides, I think we can make it work. Jackie, what's and, your And you're quite this? happy to leave Northern Ireland. You're quite happy to leave Northern Ireland under EU rule. It's not under EU rule. It's just that they can get some of their stuff from across the border, that's all. As we divert, no, as we diverge more and more, and part of the reason of leaving the EU was to be, to be diverging more and more and make our own rules, Northern Ireland will be left behind. And that's precisely what the Irish government wants. I just want to get Jackie's take on this. Jackie, where are you? I think this comes down to an issue of trust. You know, Boris Johnson promised that there would be no barriers in the Irish Sea. He then and his government signed up to a protocol that actually put barriers there. Um, and he is all over the place on this. Um, I don't often agree with Matthew Paris. In fact, I don't think I've ever agreed with him. But on this occasion, I think he is right. I think it is about, in the interests of the people of Northern Ireland and their economy, getting around the table and sorting this out. I find Kate Hoey's position, um, frankly, to not be credible at all. Kate? Well, I, I, I'm not surprised that, uh, that uh, Jackie does say that. Uh, but the reality is the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which is what this protocol was all about trying to protect, is being broken. It's broken now because the east-west relationship of the Belfast Agreement has been has been completely broken. The north-south has carried on. So therefore, people in Northern Ireland who signed up to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement because they thought it was going to be a balanced agreement are seeing that their side of things is now no longer being accepted. East-west is being is being uh, abandoned. Anthony. So that's why, in the end, and treaties, international treaties, have been changed over time that has you know you can't say okay. forever and ever a treaty lasts forever and ever it just doesn't we've literally okay. just signed it we've literally just signed it and you want to scrap it already i want to let anthony come back on that point about boris johnson having broken trust we haven't got much time well i think the northern ireland protocol could have worked and it could still work if there's adjustments on either side, if there's good faith on both sides. I think part of the problem has been uh, that the way that it's actually been interpreted and almost any border agreement, if you're overzealous about it, if you gold plate it, if you do more inspections than you need to, you can get things not to work properly. I think that is fundamentally what has happened with the Northern Ireland Protocol is it's been overzealously interpreted, I mean, mainly on the EU side, but actually some of our own customs officials as well. But And so maybe it needs adjustment, but I think it probably can get to work uh, in a way that it's intended to work. But if not, we might have to look again at the whole thing. So it's salvageable, but a bit more effort by the sounds of it. I hope it's you. salvageable. Well, we will see, no doubt, much more about this in the coming days. But for us, that's it for now. Do join me tomorrow when I'll be back with Politics UK. For now, have a good lunchtime. Goodbye. <laughs>